Well, hello everyone, I'm Renee Knapp. I'm the Family and Consumer Science Extension Agent in Henderson and in Transylvania County. I'm glad that you joined us today in the kitchen for jams and jellies, and we're gonna make strawberry jam. So before we get started, I just kind of wanted to go over some basics of canning and uh, making jams and things. One of the first things that you need is a hot water bath because you need to process all of your jams and jellies. Um, and, and I use jams and jellies, but you know, there's six different classes of soft spreads. So I should be using that term. So there's jams, which is the pulp and the seeds of the fruit. There's jelly, which is just the juice. Uh, there's marmalades, and we often think of orange marmalade with uh, bits of citrus peel in the uh, soft spread. There's preserves, which is slices of fruit suspended in a honey-like um, syrup. And there are conserves, and a true conserve has uh, nuts and raisins in it. And then the last uh, category or class is um, butters. And the one that we think most often of it uh, is apple butter. So uh, all of those need to be processed in a hot water bath uh, to make sure that they're safe. And I know that, you know, growing up, a lot of us probably grew up with jams and jellies and soft spreads not being processed in the hot water bath, but it is necessary to get it to that uh, 212 temperature on the inside to kill any bacteria uh, that could be, you know, in the air around us. Now, um, and another thing that probably some of us grew up with was uh, using the paraffin on the top. That's not recommended any longer because with the paraffin, when it is melted and poured out on the surface of your soft spread, it will set and adhere to the edges of your jar. But then there might be some uh, temperature fluctuations and that may pull away, allow bacteria in there and then maybe spread back out and then seal that bacteria back up in there and cause mold to grow and everything. So, so that's not recommended any longer either. The other thing that we have to remember is, um, at one time, I remember um, we thought that mold just grew across the top of your products uh, and you could scrape off an inch of it and eat the rest of it. Well, through research, they have found that the mold spores grow straight down. So it's contaminating the entire jar of jam. So uh, if you find mold growing on your uh, soft spreads, just go ahead and uh, throw them out because they're not considered safe. So with the canner, hot water bath, you can use any pot that is deep enough for a rack, your jars, and one to two inches of water over the top of the jars. So you could technically use a spaghetti pot. Uh, and you want something to suspend uh, the jars off the bottom of the pot because you don't want the heat from the burner to transfer through the pot to the jars because that could cause it to break. Also, you want a, the rack that will suspend it up some so that that water can circulate around the bottom of the jar and all around the jar so that it uh, is getting to that correct temperature. So if you have a smaller pot, you know, if even a pot such as this, you could put like a cake cooling rack in the bottom, put your jars on it and just make sure that you have one to two inches of water over the top. Some um, precautions that you need to remember is, you know, never double your recipe. You know, no matter how many gallons of strawberries or berries or fruit that you have, you just need to make that one recipe because you need to work quickly so that the water can evaporate and, um, you know, you end up with a good gelling product. So never double it, you know, or, and even if, you know, some of the recipes cost for an insanely large amount of sugar. Don't decrease the sugar in that because what you're gonna end up with is a syrup, 
Now, if the syrup is what you want to go in your pancakes or your ice cream or cake or whatever, then that's fine. But you do not want to uh, decrease the amount of sugar. Uh, there are commercial pectins on the market that um, has uh, recipes for low to no sugar. Um, so there's one put, uh, made by Ball and one made by Sure Gel. And uh, you just follow the direction uh, on the recipe uh, sheets inside. This is a regular uh, pectin, commercial pectin. The pectin is naturally found in fruits, but then you can also use the commercial pectin. Pectin helps to make the uh, jams and jellies firm and set up. So uh, you can make jams and jellies without commercial pectin. Uh, you just have to cook them for longer. Uh, in one of the other classes that I had, I, um, the lady was talking about she had made strawberry jam without the pectin and had to cook it for 45 minutes. The demonstration that I showed her on Monday, uh, I used the low to no sugar pectin and we boiled it for a minute and it set up beautifully. So she was amazed at the time difference. So all of your fruits do have natural pectin in them and it's found just directly under the skin of the fruit or uh, around the berries. And sometimes you can add a different fruit that has more pectin in it too. So, so your canner is gonna be one of your main expenses for making jams and jellies. Your jars are gonna be the next one. And here is um, are some examples. This is a um, three quarter pint jelly jar. This is a pint. And this is a peanut butter jar. And this one, this is plastic. So this would not be recommended to put your jelly or jams or soft spreads in. I had another one that uh, had a handle on it. And it, it was one that uh, came with jams or jellies in it. But that one is not recommended either because it has a different threading, which is the twist around the top of the jars. So the regular hung canning lids and rings don't, wouldn't fit that. And you can't reuse, uh, you know, the lid that came with it. So also with like mayonnaise jars and uh, other jars, those are only tempered for a one-time use. So uh, don't reuse those uh, for your jams and jellies. So uh, there is one that you can tell if it is uh, a home canning jar, it will have the embossing on the front. Uh, this one is Golden Harvest or Mason. So there's Mason, Atlas, Kerr, Ball, and I believe that may be all. So there's four different brands, but there's a fifth one that doesn't have any of the embossing on the front. So you just have to be aware of that. I don't know how you could market, you know, if you bought a new case of the jars, maybe you could uh, use a Sharpie uh, pen and make an X on the bottom uh, just to make sure that, you know, you know that that is a home candy jar rather than like a mayonnaise jar or something. So the lids and the rings are in, ten, uh, the lids are for a one-time use only. And I have some in a bowl of water over here. They're clean. So with the uh, canning lids, they have the plastisol that is around the outside. And that's what creates the seal around the edge of your jar. That's why it's intended for a one-time use only. Once that seal is made, uh, you know, you can't fluff it up or anything to be able to use it again. The rings, you can use those over and over and over again, just as long as they don't become overly rusted or bent. So um, the um, only purpose that the ring does is to hold this in place on the edge of the jar. So once you put, start putting your rings on your finished product, you want just to make sure that that ring goes on hand tight. 
There may be some air in the jar that needs to work itself out from underneath the lid. Uh, and you don't want to that on there too tightly because that could cause the jar to break. So just hand tight, just, just enough to hold it on there. So, so after, you take, after we take them out of the canner, we're gonna put them on a cool surface to dry and to uh, cool down. Um, you may be tempted to, as the jars, can, as you take them out of the canner, you know, there's going to be water on top of the jars. So you may be til uh, tempted to tilt them to pour that water off. Don't do that because some of the berries uh, from the fruit or the pulp could get under the lid and cause it not to seal. So um, just do a robot movement up, over, and set down on your padded surface to dry. Uh, you can have a certain, you know, couple of towels folded, uh, or you can use newspapers if you want to do that. Just something uh, that is going to be softened as a, uh, you put them on the counter. Now, um, you don't want to put them near like a ceiling fan or an air conditioning vent or anything like that because you want them to cool on their own. So just, you know, allow them to sit quietly for 20 to 24, I'm sorry, for 12 to 24 hours before you move them. So wherever you're putting them, you want to make sure that they won't have to be moved again within that period of time. So uh, like if I were cooking dinner here tonight, I wouldn't want to take them out of the counter and put them here because I might need this area for cooking uh, my meal. So. So make sure that they are somewhere where they're not going to be disturbed. So when I take them out of the canner, I'll probably put them over on the padded surface uh, back next to the refrigerator here. So, okay, so um, the lids and rings, you know, there's the ball. Uh, there's also cur that you might find too. And it doesn't matter which one that you use, you know, uh, we, um, we hear, you know, well, you know, I prefer cur, or I only use ball. You know, most of the lids are produced by the same manufacturing company and just a different name put on them. So, you know, it's like a trick. So, so after 12 to 24 hours, make sure that your seal is uh, sealed, compressed. You can uh, hear it popping a lot of times as you're taking them out of the canner to cool them. So, and you know that they are, you know, sealed good and tight. That that compound that's um, that I showed you, that is going to form around the lip of the jar and create that seal. So after 12 to 24 hours, take that ring off, wash it, dry, put it away for the next run because that seal is already formed on your jar. Now, if you were to uh, store the jar in your cabinet uh, with that ring on, if something were to happen and that seal uh, were to break or you know come loose with that ring on, uh, it could cause the jar to reseal. And that would be, you know, you would have bacteria in there. So go ahead and wash them. Take them off, wash them, rinse them, dry them, and use them for the next one. So once you open the jar to enjoy you know, your soft spread on toast or a bagel or something, you've got that loose lid. So what do you do? You know, because a lid like that is not going to stay on your jar in the refrigerator. So they do, you can purchase the storage lids. This one is by Bob, but there's others too. I like to recycle things. So I take my mayonnaise jar lids and they fit right on there. So I can store this in the refrigerator. So these are the uh, white storage lids that you can purchase too. So, and they fit on there fine. Uh, there's even, uh, there's no jar lid from like peanut butter or anything like that that fits the wide mouth uh, jars. So, um, but they do have the ones that you can purchase. So. so what I've done is I have already measured out 
the strawberries and remove this so you can see. And I, I follow the, the re, I'm following the recipe that is out of the pectin box. And um, it's important that you read these directions up here because this is going to be the steps that you're going to follow. So, um, and one of the things that you have to do is you measure your sugar and I've got it here in the bowl. Uh, we're, we needed four cups of sugar. So out of that four cups, I took a fourth of a cup according to the direction and put it in a bowl with the package of pectin. So there's powdered pectin and then there is uh, liquid pectin too. And each one of those, you know, you have to follow the directions with it as to when it uh, goes into your uh, jam product. So I'm going to move all this so that it goes into the pot. So I have my pot here and I'm going to put my six cups strawberries in here. Then I am going to put the pectin and fourth of a cup of sugar in and stir that. I want to stir it in really well. I'm going to go ahead and turn the heat on. So I'm going to start out on high. You want to cook it as quickly as you can. So um, that's why you want to start out with high heat. So with these berries, we washed them and um, Betsy, the in, our intern this summer, crushed them using the um, little food processor and chopped them up. So uh, we are, and then I measured them out. So I'm looking forward to having Betsy help them <laughs> even do some of this. So. So what we're going to do is we are going to bring this to a boil, and um, and that's getting it good and hot. You want to use a Dutch oven about this size pie. Uh, you don't want to use one too big or one too small because a pot this size, you're going to be able to cook it and cook it quickly and let some of the water from the fruit and the juice evaporate too. So. Once this comes to a boil that we can't stir down, we're going to dump the sugar in. And you want to dump it in and uh, stir it in so that you can get it all mixed up, mixed in. So there's other tools that you might want to use and have handy uh, when you're making jam. Uh, I like to have a take a baking sheet and put the jars in it. These we're not going to use. And then that way, if I spill some over, it goes on the towel where I can wash it. And it doesn't get all over the counter. Right now, I've got the jars in a pot of hot water over here. And you want your jars comparable in temperature to your uh, soft spread mixture. So, I also put the lids and the rings in the bowl too. Tell Betsy that pretty soon I'll have every piece of equipment in the kitchen dirt. So, this is a lid one. This has a magnet in the end of it, and you can use it to lift your lid and your ring up. This was real handy when uh, um, it was recommended that you bring your lids to simmering. Most of the lids now do not have to be simmered on. They were, uh, the manufacturers recommend is that they be clean. So um, the lids and the rings over there in the bowl are clean, but I did put hot water on them. So. so. This is what it looks like at this point. And it's getting ready to have the sugar added. So a funnel is going to be, come in handy too as you put that on your uh, jar to put your jam in to help channel that in there so you don't end up with 
jams or jellies all over everywhere. I also have a hot water bath with the rack up and water in there and it's coming to uh, boiling so that it will be uh, at the right temperature when we put the jars in. And the reason that you want your rack up out of the water is so that you can set your jars down in there without them turning over. You don't want um, your jars to turn over and the jam and the stuff get underneath the lid. Sarah, is there any questions? Well, I was about to ask that. There's no nothing in the chat, but um, this one, while we're we're uh, waiting for it to come to a boil and getting ready to add the sugar, does anybody have a question for Renee? Go ahead and unmute and get Madeline. Do you have a question? I do have a question. So, and I'm sorry, I tapped in just a minute late, so I don't know if I missed it, but. You're not sterilizing the jars before you fill them, or we do need to sterilize? That's a good question because a lot of your recipes will say sterilize your jars. With our altitude, we have to adjust by adding five minutes to it. So if we lived at a lower elevation where we were only processing for 10 minutes, we would need to sterilize them. And that would mean putting them in the pot of uh, boiling water and bringing them to a boil. But if you are processing for longer than 10 minutes, you do not have to sterilize your jars. You just want them to be good and clean. I run these through the dishwasher so they are clean and I put them in hot water over here. So that is a very good question. Thank you for bringing that up. And, and do you run the lids through the dishwasher too or will that affect the sealed plastic? With the lids and the rings, they were just washed, um, rinsed in just a bowl of water. Okay. So you don't have to run those through the dishwasher. Okay, great. And if you notice, this is coming to a bowl, but there's a lot of foam with it. You can put uh, a teaspoon of margarine or butter in it. And that will um, cut the foam down. If you don't have it, like we don't have it here, and I didn't think to bring any butter from home, we'll take a slotted spoon and take some of the foam off. But I think some of it will cook down. So. Renee, could you answer a few more questions? Yes. I've got uh, a question from Tina. Okay. Yep. So the last time I had, we had a big jam jelly party um we took them out of the bath and turned them upside down for a few minutes and then they turned them over um but it sounded to me like you just pull them straight out you don't you don't do that no that was one of the uh recommendations a few years ago uh, was to take them out of the canner or just put the lid on them and um eighth of an inch from the top and then just turn them over. Again, that's not recommended because some of the uh, berries or the seed or the pulp could get underneath the lid and keep it from um, sealing. So uh, you still want to process in the hot water bath. So that's a recommendation um, that has they've changed their mind on, but that was a good question. And then Samantha, did you have a question? Yeah, um, so I noticed that we're water bath canning. Is that a hard and fast rule for all um, jams and jellies or are there some fruits that need to be done in a pressure canner? No, with jams and jellies and fruits and pickles, they can all be done in the hot water bath. Um, they are a high acid food, so mm -hmm. they don't need the high temperature. They can be processed at a lower temperature, 212 degrees, and be safe. So, all right, uh, we are boiling. Sarah, could you time a minute, please? Yes, I can. 
It might take me just a second. Okay. And this is going really good. So I'm going to hold it off the burner for a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we may have jam all over the kitchen anyway. <laughs> I have noticed, and, and you know your stove, so I have mm -hmm. noticed that with this stove, this burner cooks super fast. It does. So um, Sarah can attest to that. Yeah. And you're at 40 seconds right now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, that, that stove is so funny. I mean, this is true. Uh, this does not go with a watch pot never boils. <laughs> All right. You have made it to a minute. Okay. So we are going to take it off the burner. So that was as package direction, right, Renee, with that it said yeah. boil it for a minute? Yeah. Okay. So we boiled it for a minute and we have lots of foam. So I am going to take this slotted spoon and I'm, I'm going to move the camera. See. I hope nobody gets, that's okay. I, I, I can, sick. I can, yeah. Hope nobody gets so dizzy. I'm going to just take some of that foam off. You know, what, up. you know what size pot that is? That be maybe a five quart? What size pot is that? Did she ask, is that uh, a five quart? I think that's an eight quart. It quart. does look like an eight quart, but yeah, this is still, some of them will, will, as soon as you add that sugar, they really do sort of fluff mm -hmm. up. If we had, you know, just a teaspoon of butter, um, we wouldn't get as much. So I think that is, it's a whole lot better than what it was. But growing up, this is what we love to eat was the foam off of the jelly mm -hmm. and jam. And that's more of an aesthetic thing, right? Yeah, it is. Um, and another thing, uh, your processing time is uh, given for the amount of air. So the foam does have air in it. So um, we would want to get rid of some of that. So, okay. so I've got my jars and I'm going to use my funnel and I'm going to label it in there. I can set it quite right. Mm -hmm. Space is a premium. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to label it in there with um jams and jellies, you want a fourth of an inch head space. And the amount of uh, and head space is the amount of space that is from the top of the jar down to the, um, the jam. So that looks like it's about a fourth of an inch. Oh, I wish you all we had smell of vision because it does smell. <laughs> it does smell good. Yeah. That one I got too full. So so you can see this is not always perfect. I've been doing this for a long time and I am by no means perfect. But I love to do it. I was raised with this um, at home. My mother and grandmother taught me things, taught me. But then there's also things that they taught me that were not right. So there are some incorrect um, procedures that People do like, you know, using the paraffin or um, turning it upside down. 
uh, not processing. That's called open kettle when you don't process it. And it will seal, but then you know, you're running more of a risk of it spoiling. So tell me some of the canning or Jantha jellies that you all have made. Has anybody done this before? You know, we used to have big jam parties. I forget what they, I forget what they called them, but there'd be a whole bunch of us get together in a kitchen and everybody had a job. It was like a process. And we did strawberry, we did cranberry. Oh, we did apple. We did apple and strawberry. And then sometimes you'd have a strawberry and apple depending on how much stuff you had left over. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. It's also fun. It was fun. Everybody gets the other, there's a little wine that walks around the room, you know, <laughs> a few glasses here and there. So Enjoying fruit. That's what it sounds like. That's right. Madeline, what have you been doing? So, well, actually, I have not canned jellies before. I've done a lot of preserves that I just then stick in the fridge, but part of my issue is like I can find a recipe that has a low enough sugar content. And so that was my question about, I know they say don't adjust the recipe um, because that, what, somehow affects the storage. Is that correct? And, and what's your favorite uh, low sugar recipe? Okay, so the sugar does, um play a role in the gelling process. Um, okay. Not for sure about um, the storage, but um, but it does with, um, you know, the... Um, the so gel. So like you were using now what they consider a low sugar and it was uh, six cups of fruit to four cups of sugar. Is that right? Right. Mm -hmm. And so would you experiment to see if you could get it down and still have a good consistency or you wouldn't? I would not recommend it because, you know, we recommend having a tried and tested recipe. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you start experimenting with lower sugar you know it's gonna we know that it's already gonna um, be runnier so because the sugar and the pectin act together some of the fruits need an acid to it to help with the gel so um you know you just want to stick with a recipe uh, that you know has been tested uh, some of the resources that we recommend um, is the So Easy to Preserve book. The, the So Easy to Preserve book comes from the University of Georgia. And the University of Georgia Extension is the National Center for Home Food Preservation. So they test all of the different recipes. So um, you can order those online if you'd like to. Or I have some in the Hendersonville office. Your uh, magnets on the bottom. Okay. <laughs> um, that um, I can sell to you. They're $20 um, if you, you know, purchase them, you know, from me. Um, so just let me know. You can email me and let me know if you want one. If you're in Bavard, uh, Transylvania County, I can bring it out here and you can pick it up from Mary Ann here at the extension office. If you're in Henderson County, you can come out of the office. If you're elsewhere, just uh, email me and um, we can get it to you even if we have to ship it. So, okay. Great, thank you. You're welcome. 
um, I actually meant to put up uh, my contact information. Um, if you want to email me, it's Renee, R-E-N-A-Y underscore NAP, K-N-A-P-P, at N-C-S-U dot E-D-U. If you want to call me, uh, you can call the Henderson County office at 828-697-4891. The Brevard office is 828-884-3109. Or if you can't get me either way with those phone numbers, my cell phone number is 828-674-3112. So hopefully one of those ways that, you know, if you run into a problem, um, you can get a hold of me. And I don't mind, you know, if it's on the weekend or um, through the week at night. Because if you have an emergency, you know, you need an answer. So that's what I'm here for. Okay, so I put a jar. Um, Sarah's going to show you what the canner looks like. So there, I spaced them around, and there was just a little opening here, and I placed a jar without a lid or ring filled with water in there. And that's just going to keep them from banging against each other. I'm going to lower it, and I want to make sure that it has one to two inches of water over the top. And it doesn't, so I'm going to add a little bit to it. Okay. I'm going to put the lid back on. And when it comes uh, back to a rolling bowl, that is when we're going to start the 15 minutes processing time. Um, you don't want to start it too early uh, because you want that water to get up to 212 degrees. So that's why you have to wait until it gets back to the rolling bowl. And you want to maintain that gentle rolling bowl. You don't want one that is going to be very vigorous and the jars beating against each other. You just want just a real gentle rolling bowl. And the way that you, um, what's the word? <laughs> maintain that is by using uh, the temperature control on your stove. So we may have to turn it down some. Now, you have to be careful that you, it doesn't turn down so much that there's no boil there. If there's no boil there um, and you just noticed it, you have to start the processing time all over again. So uh, we're gonna bring it back up to a boil and then get to that point where we can maintain that gentle rolling bowl, and then we'll start the processing time. But if at any time during that 15 minutes, the water quits boiling, that gentle rolling bowl, then we have to build it back up and then start the processing time all over again. So that maintains the temperature in the canner and around the jams the jellies or whatever you're processing and that's true for everything so uh so. renee do you can you do it with the cover off so you can watch it or you need the cover on we have to leave the cover on so that the heat stays in there but once it sometimes you can tell when it comes to a rolling bowl or maybe it's just because you know i've done it so many times we can hear it come back to a rolling bowl, and I'll lift the lid and let you see then. But we don't want to leave the lid off because, you know, that lid keeps the heat in. It. So, okay. Can you, so, um, to make tamales, we put a penny in the bottom of the pot so you could hear it boiling. Can you do that? 
What? When you make tamales, you put a penny in the bottom of the pot so that you can hear it boiling. Can you do that? You could. I don't see anything wrong with it. No. Mm -mm. And just real quick, um, I changed, I fixed the email. I didn't realize that I had capitalized the K. So just so you know, it's, it's all lowercase Renee underscore nap. And I, I accidentally went on typing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, I have a quick question. You were okay. wiping off the jars. You're yeah. wiping off the rims of the jars. How important is it to get it super clean on those rims before you put the lids on? Yeah, so it's a little bit difficult. I can hear you. So I'm going to tell Renee what you just asked. So we were talking before when she was wiping off the jars. She, so Tina wants to know how important is it that you get it really clean? What was what were you doing there when you were wiping off the jars? So you, you saw how messy sometimes it can get. And some of that jam or fruit could have gotten around the edge of the jar. So I was wiping that, especially around the rim of it, to get that off because if not, that ceiling compound on the lid would come in contact with that, but then not create a real good ceiling surface. And another thing, thank you for saying that, because sometimes you, you have to check the edges of your jars because you want a good smooth edge. You don't want one that has been chipped um, because with this, you want you know it to make a complete seal on there. So make sure that you don't have any chi uh, chips or nicks or cracks in your jar. So, um, so, and then wipe it really well. If you don't wipe it around the edges, the lids could get just really sticky and messy. But around the rim of the jar is the most important because you want that to be completely in contact with the jar edge. So, and you just used a, uh, you used a wet? I just used a paper towel folded and I dipped it in this bowl of a pot of water. A little bit, a yeah. little water. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions while we're waiting for it to come back up to temp? Is there any way to know if you did something wrong other than... Is there any way to know if you did something wrong? <laughs> the only way that you're going to know if you did something wrong, especially with jams and jellies, if you were to open uh, the lid, if there's mold there, we already know to throw that away. After 12 to 24 hours, uh, check the seal. You know, make sure that it doesn't pop. Um, also, you know, it may be too runny. Um, you know, on a rainy day, my suggestion is to never try to make jams and jellies or any soft spread on a rainy day or a high humidity day because all of that moisture in the air will attach to the sugar and the fruit and you can't get it boiled down. So now if you were doing um, a jam or a jelly without pectin, you could do some gel tests. You could, you know, use the candy thermometer and get it up to the gelling point. You could use the plate test where you put a plate and a spoon, uh, metal spoon in the freezer and take and dip your spoon out. I miss my spoon. Okay, so, and then hold it up. And you want it to sheet off the spoon, okay? Um, if it just runs off, you know that that is too runny. Uh, sometimes you make it too much pulp uh, of the fruit in there, um, especially with jellies. We will talk about jellies because jellies, you're using just the juice. So if you cooked your berries and put them like in a food mill or uh, suspended cheesecloth or something like that, you want that juice to drip through. Uh, you don't want to squeeze it because if you squeeze it, you're getting extra pulp and that's going to make it really, really stiff. Uh, with a jelly, you want it to be, um, be to the point where you can take a knife 
and spread it on your piece of toast without breaking your toast. So um, you don't want to, you know, um, get, get it too thick. If you get it too thick, there's nothing you can do. All right, Sarah was giving me the ear and you can see it boil. And that's what we want to maintain. It's just a gentle rolling boil. And I'm gonna turn the heat down just a little bit. And like I said, you will recognize with your stove if you turn it down, you know, too far, you'll get to the point where you know that at 6.5 or six and a half, it's gonna hold that boil. Or on um, this stove, this is a high, medium, high, medium, low, and warm. And um, I've, right now I've got it on medium high and we'll keep a check on it. But we don't wanna lift the lid too much because that's letting all that heat out. So, but you can hear it, uh, you know, boiling, so. Started your timer for 15. 15. Sarah is my good assistant. <laughs> Okay, I have, um, I just wanted to tell you, my dad makes violet jelly. So they'll go, he and my daughter will go out and they pick the little violets all over the yard, bring them in. And I think he, I don't know what he does to them to get it, but it's a purple, it's a purple jelly. It's usually kind of thin, yeah. it's not very thick jelly. And it doesn't really take, you, you put lemon stuff in it. So it really tastes like lemon jelly. Oh. Okay, I'm gonna, it's I'm very pretty. Up to Renee because <laughs> since she's standing beside the the canner, it's hard for her to hear. So, um, her dad and her daughter go out and pick all the violets, and they make okay. a violet jelly that's purple. That she says it actually turns out kind of thin, mm -hmm. um, and you use lemons for the pectin. So she says it just mostly tastes lemony uh -huh. to her. But what a sweet project for your yeah. your dad and your daughter uh -huh. to do <laughs> together. So a lot of people, last year I had a lady um, who made pepper jelly and she was disappointed that her peppers all sank to the bottom or sank to the bottom or rose to the top. One or the other, they didn't stay suspended throughout the mixture. So um, she was asking me about them. And with things like that, where you're adding uh, something different, you just have to cook those peppers a little bit longer to cook that air out of uh, those vegetables. So, so um, you know, so that you know, you just have to play with to make sure that you know that you're cooking them long enough. So, so. how long um, do these last once they're canned, and um, once you've opened them, how long um, do you have to use them? That's a great question. Hold on, I'm gonna say it again. So Samantha is asking two questions. One, once, when you can them, how long is their shelf life as a jam or jelly? And then the next part of that question is once you open it and have it in the refrigerator, how long do you, can you store it in the refrigerator once it's been opened? Okay, so the recommendations for you know shelf life is, um, Make no more in one season than what you can use within a, you know, a year's period of time. But that doesn't mean that next May 13th that you know, if we have any of these left over that we're gonna pop the lids off and throw them away. They're still good. The quality of it is just diminished us a little bit, but uh, you know, they're still really good. Um, as far as after they've been opened and stored in the refrigerator. Um, you know, I've never really had that problem because <laughs> I have two boys, well, I have three boys, my husband and my two boys. And, you know, things don't stay in the refrigerator too long, but I would still say probably about three months, maybe you'll notice if it starts uh, turning to sugar. Now, if you wanted to take that jam or jelly that's turning to sugar, heat them up in the microwave and stir them up. You can do that. But, um, you know, they're gonna stay good, uh, you know, just as long as, you know, they're treated well. Avoid double dipping, you know, taking a spoon and spooning that out and putting it on your peanut butter and using that same spoon to go back in the jar 
that may have had some of the peanut butter because you're introducing a foreign object into mm -hmm. the uh, jar. And um, you know, don't let anyone use this, eat out of the jam jar <laughs> because that they are putting bacteria from their mouth back in the jar. And, you know, sometimes my boys have done that. <laughs> and sometimes they get called by mom. <laughs> I don't want to tell you what things have happened in my house that I've observed <laughs> from yes. my children. Mm -hmm. Well, my, uh, my husband one day would, um, I think he ate maybe a piece of chocolate cake. You know, so of course he had chocolate on his mouth. And <laughs> he drank milk out of the jug. Oh. And I said, Robert, quit drinking out of the jug, milk jug. He said, well, how did you know that I done that? I said, because there's lip prints on the milk jug. <laughs> so I tease him about leaving lip prints. Not fingerprints, but they're lip prints. <laughs> but one of my sons uh, lives in Texas, and they were home at Christmas. So he and his wife went down to where I've got all of our canned goods stored and went shopping in mama's um, kitchen or store. So uh, they got plenty of jams and jellies and applesauce and green beans and tomatoes and things like that. And I have a coworker in Henderson County that swears that, you know, if the apocalypse comes, he knows where he's coming to eat. <laughs> so, so it is fun to do and you know something to be proud of you know to show people you know this is what I did and on that note make sure that you enter it in the Mountain State Fair um, <laughs> you know it, you're not going to get rich you know I think the premiums on a blue ribbon is eight dollars maybe mm -hmm. now you know that might buy a little bit of your sugar <laughs> and maybe a pack of sure gel or uh, your pectin but, but, you know, it's that pride of being able to show someone, you know, your strawberry jam that you got a blue ribbon on. So, uh, and being able to give that jar of jam to a family member or a friend saying, you know, this is my blue ribbon winning strawberry jam. So. Renee, do you have a, a good source? Like, for instance, right now it's, it's, strawberries are in season um so where do you where do you find enough fruit to to do this to, to run a whole batch or several batches of Good jam? question well you can look at your um tailgate markets farmers markets um you know any of those places that have them for sale um there's a lot of you pick places that you can go in with your family and pick strawberries. And, you know, that would be a nice family outing to be able to do. Um, even if you have, um, you know, a strawberry patch out in your backyard, go and pick those. You don't have to have enough to make your um, full run. What you can do with those is freeze them and bring them out later on, even in the winter when it's a little bit cooler, maybe a little bit less busy, and go ahead and make your jams and jellies then. Um, that's the way I've done a lot of my fruits because the summer is a busy time for me with uh, teaching food preservation classes and other activities. So, you know, if I get some strawberries or grapes or blueberries or whatever, I go ahead and freeze them and then can uh, able to take them out and uh, use them. With that, if you freeze them, don't thaw them. Just allow, you know, thaw them enough that you can crush them um, and um, be able to measure. So, so, but check your, you know, tailgate markets, farmer's markets, local food, uh, produce stands, uh, support your local farmers with that. I've got a strawberry patch that I've gotten six strawberries out of, but they've gotten eaten. They don't make it to the freezer. <laughs> yeah. They're well, going to be real little too. Yeah. 
that not all of these strawberries made it from Hendersonville to uh, Picard today. Um, I wanted to do quality assurance, you know, I wanted to make sure that they were good enough to put in the pipes. And, and they were just so tempting sitting there next to me. I should have put them in the very back of the car. <laughs> Samantha, do you have a question? Not right now. <laughs> Not right now? Okay. Wasn't sure. But yeah, that's that's true. Quality assurance is a very important step. It really is. You, you said something earlier about um, elevation, Renee, and that, that seems a little confusing. Can you tell me a little bit more about like why you were you were paying attention to the elevation when you were okay. So water boils at different elevation points. So you, uh, and, you know, if it's lower, it's going to boil at 212 degrees. Higher elevations is going to you know, take a little bit longer. So that's why we add the time to the hot water bath. With pressure canners, we add uh, pounds to that. So but you, you want to make sure that you get it up you know, to the 212 and for the right time, period of time. So, okay. all right, thanks. I also mentioned that, you know, jams and jellies, all your sauce spreads, your pickles and relishes um, and fruits are all processed in the hot water bath. Those are high acid foods and can be done low acid or low temperatures with uh, vegetables, meat, soups, stews, um, those are low acid foods, so those need to be done at a high temperature. And you can only get that high temperature in a pressure canner. And I know a lot of people are afraid of pressure canners, but really they are nothing to be afraid of if you operate them correctly. You know, think about, you know, uh, a car. You know, cars can be dangerous, but if we operate them correctly, then they're going to do the trick. So... Um, as far as some of the other classes that I've got scheduled, um, I'm going to postpone the fruits and the vegetables classes. I think I just got so excited about scheduling, you know, things that, uh, you know, I didn't think about what was in season. And the fruits was scheduled for Monday. And the vegetables, I think, is another couple of weeks away. So I'm going to postpone those a little bit so that we can actually get some fresh produce uh, to, uh, to put in the jar to can, so I can show you how to do that. So if you haven't signed up for those, uh, you know, uh, go ahead and sign up, let Ken know or Mary Ann uh, here in the Brevard office or email me and I'll get you on the list. So uh, the $25 that I charge for in-person uh, classes was so that you could get the So Easy to Preserve book. Uh, and that is you know, just a, a great resource uh, that you know, has all kinds of different recipes in it. And then um, you know, it's even got some like you know, troubleshooting. If your jelly uh, is too thin, what do you do? What can you do with that? And that's an easy fix because uh, you can remake it. So, um, but that has directions in there too. But all of those recipes are tested. So, you know, if you have an Aunt Martha or <laughs> Aunt Susie that has passed down these recipes, you know, over the years, you know, just be careful with those because those may not be tried or tested. Um, and we want you to be safe rather than sorry. And, you know, I've had people to say, but my grandmother did it this way and she lived to be 104, whatever. <laughs> you know, our grandparents are, lived in a different age and time than what we're living in now. So that's not research-based, that is Renee-based, but um, that's my thing, you know, my feelings on it. We want you to be safe. I don't want to see your name in the obituary, so. <laughs> So uh, just make sure you're safe. Okay, one more question. That's a, oh, can I ask, that was a follow-up or, or a lead into my question, which is, is all fruit 
acidic enough that you can do it in a, in a hot water bath and not worry about botulism? Or are there some fruits like peaches maybe that wouldn't be as acidic as they need to be? Are all fruits acidic enough that you can do them in a hot water bath and not? You know, there are a few things that are considered botanically fruit that mm -hmm. don't have. And so that's why you're always following a recipe. But I'm, I'm going to let Renee answer that. Yeah. But, but, you know, we think of avocados as a fruit. You're right. Mm -hmm. so, um, well, and tomatoes, you know, uh, we think of tomatoes. I think of tomatoes as a vegetable, but I think botanically, you know, they are actually a vegetable. Tomatoes is one that you can do either way in a pressure canner or in a hot water bath. So either way, um, you can do it. I did a test in my kitchen at home and, um, you know, it was like a race to the end. You know, it was about the same time. So, um, you know, whichever one you feel more comfortable with. Now, tomatoes and figs have to have an acid added to them to bring them up to the acidic level. Those are the only two that uh, you have to add uh, acid to. And that's like a lemon juice or a vinegar or citric acid crystals. So, so the timer has gone off and I have turned the burner off. So I'm going to use the jar lifter and you want to put it around the neck of the jar, lift it up and bring it over. And if you notice, there's water on the top of it and I am just doing the robot method of up, out and over. And then I will put them over on the folded towel to cool. We should be hearing them pop which means that that vacuum seal is being made. I haven't heard any popping yet. You want to space them out so that there's about an inch around them so that they can have um, space to cool. So. I heard one. Yep. I don't know if you can hear it out in TV land, but we just heard one pop. That's one thing I remember with my mother-in-law and I, we would, we would kind of have one of those parties when we were canning and, and we'd be talking and then we'd start counting one, two, <laughs> whenever we'd hear a pop, we'd make sure we got them all. My husband did not grow up with canning, so um, he, he didn't think it was worthwhile until he started eating a lot of it, <laughs> and now he is my biggest help. So, and, and what he loves to do is listen for the pop mm -hmm. and, and check them, make sure that they're all sealed. Mm -hmm. so. Do we have any more questions while we're listening for them to pop? Oh, they're oh, going. Where, when, what do you recommend for um, storing them? Like, do you put them in a cupboard? Do you have to keep them in a cool, dark place? What's the best way? I, um, of course, I've got a cool, dry place in the basement. 
Um, if you don't have that, you can um, put them back in the box after they've all cooled and you've removed your rings, store them under the bed or maybe <laughs> the back of the closet or, you know, somewhere where it's cool and dry. You know, um, you do, wouldn't want to store them in the cabinet with a hot water heater because, you know, that would get hot. But just somewhere cool and dry if you've got space in your cabinet. Uh, you know, that would be a good uh, spot also. So. And keeping them out of the sun is going to keep that pretty color too. I, I wish you could see it in real life. These, these look like rubies over here. So is marinara, if I'm going to cook and can marinara, is that, would that be like this jam and jellies process or would it be with one. marinara, um, any tomato product that you are not adding other vegetables to, or if you are uh, adding other vegetables to that vegetable, but adding vinegar, you again, using a tried and tested recipe, uh, one that is recommended from the um, University of Georgia Extension from the National Center for Home Food Preservation. Uh, like salsa, if you take the tomatoes and start adding peppers of all kinds and onions and things, you're adding that low acid food. And especially if you're not adding the correct amount of vinegar to raise that acidity level, that's where you could end up with some botulism. So it's, it's important, you know, to uh, you know, I can't stress it enough to follow a tested recipe. So if you, um, if you have questions, you know, about yours or, you know, if you want uh, one of the recipes out of the book, uh, I'll be glad to send it to you. Or you can go online. They've actually got a website. Um, it's kuga.edu. N C N F H F P uh, N C that was right N C H F P National Center for Home Food Preservation. So uh, they've got recipes on there, uh, and then they've got questions too that um, or answers to questions that people have sent in. So. It sounds like it might be better just to can the tomatoes and then make the marinara when you open the tomatoes. Right. Yeah. You know, it, freezing is another option, you know, if you don't yeah. want to. Um, I, I freeze a lot of marinara and then we run okay. through it through the winter. But this year, I, I don't know what I was thinking, but I, I have about like 10 San Marzano tomato plants and about six or eight Roma tomato plants and then all the other tomatoes. And I, I don't, I don't know what I was thinking. Y'all <laughs> want any tomato plants? I've got plenty of them. <laughs> you are going to be a favorite neighbor. It sounds like. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments? I just want to say you've done a great job. It's a really good, um, presentation. I learned a lot. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you all joining us. If we all hadn't joined us, we'd been here by ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so email me if you have questions or call me um, if, either way. If you have questions, be glad to help and hope to see or hear from you in some of the other classes too.